So we've heard about arithmetic coding, we've heard about Huffman coding actually, and it turns out we can apply the techniques we're going to describe today to either of them. But we spent all this time talking about arithmetic coding. We've seen some reasons why arithmetic coding um, might be beneficial to use over Huffman coding. One thing that may not have been, I guess, obvious in the discussion of that is that one of the downsides of arithmetic coding, interestingly, is speed. It's, it's strange because you think you process each symbol and you output a bunch of bits. Um, and maybe you output fewer bits than you would with Huffman coding. It turns out that the set of operations we have to do at each step of arithmetic coding are a bit heavier in terms of computational requirements, not asymptotically, just a few more operations requiring things like arithmetic um, than Huffman coding. Once you've d devised a Huffman code for an input sequence, a, a sequence of a billion symbols or something, then actually encoding is really easy. You just take each symbol and look it up in a table, basically. Um, you could run through a tree to find it, but uh, obviously if you're encoding a huge amount of things, it would make sense to develop a lookup table. And, and so um, Huffman coding is extremely fast in practice because all it requires is, is indirection. It requires looking stuff up in an array, which of course usually ends up in the cache, whereas arithmetic coding requires a bunch of arithmetic. Um, well, it requires looking stuff up in tables as well. You have to work out the probability of the symbol you're, you're dealing with. Then you have to do some arithmetic, and then you have to do a bunch of shift operations, which amounts to a nested loop because you have to do um, potentially multiple shifts per iteration. And you may have to do some funny uh, business with folding out bits and things, which does add up. And so arithmetic coding is understood to be a bit slower on average um, than actually doing encoding with a Huffman tree. One reason why we really like it we can apply this to Huffman coding as well, although this lecture is going gonna, is gonna to frame it in terms of arithmetic coding. One reason we like it is that the startup cost of arithmetic coding is very low. There's no requirement to build a Huffman tree or build a tree or do anything else. We have to work out the probability of each symbol and the cumulative probability of that symbol, and that's it. Uh, so uh, the, the point of this lecture is to touch on this. Uh, there, are, there could be entire courses just on the subject of, of adaptive models for um, statistical uh, uh, encoding schemes. Um, and I want to talk about this just enough that you could employ such a thing on assignment um, three if you want to. And I really encourage you to do so because it's an extremely powerful technique. And we're going to, at the very end of this, touch on a, a scheme called PPM which is sort of a competitor to the LZ family as a clever way of having the encoder and decoder on either end of the compressed bitstream uh, collude to some extent on being able to find efficient ways of representing symbols. So here I have this probability distribution. Now we've seen this is, we spent the entire arithmetic coding sequence talking about this. And we know that with arithmetic coding, we take our probability distribution and we repeatedly sort of zoom in on the window for each character. If I know the first character is a B, then I zoom in on that and I look at, okay, here's BA and here's BB and here's BC. And we know that arithmetic coding has this nice property that up to numerical errors happening way down at the far end of our expansion, so in one of the least significant decimal places, we know that arithmetic encoding can represent at each step the, the window assigned to each character with uh, a number very faithful to its true probability, not assigning it some artificial encoded probability. And so at each step, I narrow my probability range and then I encode the next symbol. And I slowly, over the course of whatever size my input is, 10 symbols, 100 symbols, a million symbols, I narrow my range closer and closer together, and then I eventually choose as my compressed representation a single number. So the reason why I like this, uh, for what I'm about to discuss, is that arithmetic coding, all I have to do to start it up is set low to be zero, high to be one, and then work out my table of cumulative probabilities or cumulative frequencies. I would typically use the frequency version if I'm doing the integer variant of arithmetic coding. For Huffman coding, um, actually doing the encoding is, pretty, is really fast because I have to do very little work for that. But to actually get to the point of having the code for each character I, or each symbol, I have to develop, design, uh, um, work out a Huffman tree. I have to perform the Huffman coding algorithm. I have to iteratively build the tree by merging, um, which can be uh, a bit heavier. So I mean, there are lots of efficient ways of implementing trees, but I still have to do an algorithm that uh, works with my entire symbol set and, and iteratively builds up a tree. But here's the question. Why is it that if I have this set of probabilities, so A is 0.45, B is 0.35, and C is 0.2, at this step, that I have to use the same probability distribution at the next step? I mean, seriously. 
why isn't it that I couldn't say something like, hey, I know that uh, in this example here, I've got B, A, and then I'm choosing what comes next. Suppose that I know that in my input, you never see an A following another A. Suppose I know that. Well, if that's the case, do I, am, or why wouldn't I be allowed to just say, nope, this, in fact, B gets half of the real estate, C gets the other half. There will never be an A. The probability of A at this step will be zero. Do I really have to use the same probability distribution at every single step? And the answer is no, I can do whatever I want. And more importantly, arithmetic coding gives me a pretty easy option to do that. It doesn't take much work to change the probability distribution that I use. I just have to look up the probability in a different table. So for example, I mean, because each iteration is independent, uh, I have the probabilities I used at this step and I change low and I change high. So now low is this and high is this. And once those values are changed and I loop back around and I get to the next iteration, do you have any idea what values I used to get there? Well, no, it doesn't make any difference. You just have to take this and somehow split it up into a window for A, B, and C. It makes no difference whether you use the same strategy that I used at the previous step. The only real requirement is that the decompressor can do the same thing that you do when you're compressing. As long as you can think of a way for the you and the decompressor to stay synchronized, you can use whatever range of probabilities you want at each step, um, with the one caveat that you, of course, have to make sure that no matter what you want to encode next, you always have an option of doing that. So if you assign A a probability of zero, then it's impossible for A to be the next character. So you have to be very careful about that option, but you still have that option. It's up to you which probabilities you use, as long as you can make sure the decompressor uses the same ones at each step. Um, and so this finally gives us a way of getting over this, this issue we've had since May of why are we assuming that symbols are independent? We know that they aren't. And even if they are, what about this issue of uh, identical distribution? Even if every symbol's value is independent from the previous one, what if we happen to know that the probability of seeing A as the fifth character is somehow higher or lower than the probability of seeing A as the third character? What if we know that certain letters of the alphabet only appear at even-numbered positions? Uh, that could happen. There are input sequences where that could happen, and you could write programmatic logic to discover it. Why have we been operating all this time on this idea that entropy code Coding has to assume things are independent and identically distributed. Certainly our notion of entropy requires that, but our, the encodings that we do might be of input sequences where that doesn't hold. And so what I'm going to discuss is the ability to incorporate information, including information about dependencies or distributions of characters, or maybe preconceptions about how things are distributed, incorporate that information into the entropy coding part of your compression scheme. So you, you might do RLE, you might do move to front encoding, whatever. At the very end, you might be left with a sequence that still has patterns, and you can actually um, address those patterns in the arithmetic coder. It turns out you could do the same thing with Huffman coding. I mean, really, you could operate, if you and the decompressor agree, you could decide that at each step of encoding, you will use a different Huffman tree. You'll keep modifying your Huffman tree, or you'll have sev several Huffman trees that you keep, and you'll use different ones. As I mentioned in the BZIP lecture, BZIP actually has that ability. You can define 10 different Huffman trees, and you can say every, every 20 characters switch between, or every, I think it's some fixed number of characters. You can switch between which Huffman code you're using. That's valid. What I'm going to get to is, why don't we design a compression scheme that learns? Why don't we design a compression scheme that starts with no knowledge of our input sequence, and then over time changes its view of the probabilities based on what it's already seen? That's fair game. All we need is at each step, independent of the previous step, to have some idea of what the probability of each character is. We could guess wrong. We, we, we don't have to actually have the probability be correct. We just have a probability for each symbol at each step. And we can factor into that the ability maybe to predict what symbol comes next and to give it a higher probability. So for example, I could decide that maybe for some reason I think a B is often followed by a C. And therefore, if I've encoded a B as my previous character, uh, use this sort of skewed probability distribution for the next character. That's valid as long as I make sure that the decompressor keeps up with my logic, either because I've hard-coded the logic or because I somehow communicate with the decompressor. I include extra metadata that explains what sequence I'm going to be following.
So there are lots of reasons we might want to do this. Um, modify our, our probability table at each step. I'm going to focus on one, although for assignment three, there are lots of reasons why modifying probabilities in a static way could really be helpful. I want to talk about adaptive encoding, which is where as you go through your encoding process, your probability table gets modified based on what you've already seen. And the reason why I want to focus on that is that it's really easy for the decompressor to keep up with the compressor. Because if both of them are only using the input data that's already been seen, so you've already encoded, suppose you're encoding the sequence A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C. If you're encoding this character and your idea of what probabilities are, uh, exist are based on all of the previous characters, you know that the decompressor can get all the same information you have because the decompressor, by the time it gets to this character, will have decompressed compressed all of those symbols. Not indeed unlike the way that LZW worked at the very beginning of the course, um, where the decompressor was able to sort of uh, maintain lockstep with the compressor. We can use the same logic here. We can modify our probabilities as we go forward with whatever heuristics we want, as long as the same data is available to the decompressor at each step. Now we could also, of course, um, encode some data before our, our encoded stream about whatever we want. The same way we would encode a Huffman table, we could, or a Huffman tree, we could also encode our probability table or something else. Um, so adaptive coding, modifying the probability of each symbol at each step, is not a specifically arithmetic coding thing. It's just that arithmetic coding makes it really easy because all you need for arithmetic coding is the probability table. Whereas with Huffman coding, you could modify the probability of each symbol at each step, but really to do that, you'd have to, I, I don't know, modify the Huffman tree or regenerate the Huffman tree, which is not um, a lot of fun. I mean, there are ways of doing that. There are techniques for what's called adaptive Huffman coding. And if you implement one on assignment three, you can get some marks for that. that that's a, a great idea, but it's not as obvious how we would do that as it is with arithmetic coding, where all we have to do is modify that cumulative probability distribution. Um, and so just to, to make it this clear, we've been assuming this whole time in the previous two lectures that the compressor and decompressor both for some reason knew what the probability table for the, the symbols was. They, they somehow both had this information. Um, now, how do we convey that? I mean, I mean, like the way that we work with Huffman coding is we assume that I've encoded my Huffman tree into the compressed bit stream somewhere before I begin the encoding with those, those um, the Huffman codes. Um, what I could do is I could store my frequency or probability table into my compressed bit stream. So there's a problem with that. One, if I encode probabilities, I guess I have to encode floating point values or fixed point values. That's a bit ugly. Um, I could encode them as frequencies, and we've seen that that tends to be more helpful for the uh, integer valued arithmetic coder. The problem is, unlike a Huffman code, um, if I have a frequency table on a bunch of symbols, just frequency, then they might be similar, but I, I will likely end up with things like, okay, six, nine, seven, and then 10. And the problem is that even if frequencies are similar between characters, so A is six and B is nine, or even if A is six and B is seven, um, I can't really use RLE because they're different. So I, there's not gonna be a run of consecutive frequencies, especially if my input data was really large, because if my input data is large, it's pretty likely I'm gonna have things like this happening, where I've got you know 6,000, 6,002, and then 6,001. I could have something like this happening where they actually are pretty similar. Maybe some sort of delta compression could help me a little bit on this example but RLE wouldn't help me. Um, the other problem is even if I have a lot of symbols with a frequency similar to 6,000, it's unlikely that neighboring symbols will necessarily exhibit that correlation. So maybe we've got this, um, we've got uh, A has a frequency of 6,000 and B has a frequency of 6,001, but, but B, or sorry, C has a frequency of 6,001, but B's frequency is 9,000. So because the ordering of symbols in my, in my character set is sort of arbitrary, I can't even really be guaranteed delta compression can help me too much. Unlike our previous example of the topography where delta compression was a good assumption to make because we assume topography is changes gradually, the distribution of frequencies of symbols is completely arbitrary. And if you even think about the English alphabet, the most frequently occurring symbols aren't next to each other in the alphabet. Um, so I think the three most frequently occurring symbols in the English alphabet are ET and A, and those are not next to each other. And so the, the, the sort of natural ordering of the frequency table doesn't actually match this, the ordering of symbols in ASCII. So encoding the frequency table can be a bit of a tough one. Um, and of course, you could always use arithmetic coding where you don't. You just assume in compressor and decompressor that you always use the same fixed set of frequencies. 
One really easy one to use that would help you with, let's say, compressing text would just be to go get the average frequency of occurrences of each letter and use that as a fixed static frequency table. But we want the ability to have variable frequency tables because you want to be able to compress all sorts of different data. And we don't want there to be a case where I might know you're using a frequency table that gives a very low frequency to a specific character, and then I can construct a really bad input that consists entirely of that character. We want the ability of the scheme to adapt to a specific input. So we could store the frequency table, but that requires us to save up all of our data, figure out the frequencies, and then find some efficient way of storing the table. And as you've noticed from uh, assignment uh, two and from looking at the BZIP lecture, that's no small feat. Even encoding a Huffman tree, which might, might be easier to encode because it's just a bunch of code links, even that's a bit of a rough one. Um, and there's lots of approach, lots of um, hoops you have to jump through to get that to be done efficiently. And the same is true of frequency tables. And so we, we've seen that you have to really go out of your way to get a Huffman code um, encoded efficiently. Um, and maybe to some extent, we do not want to have to save up our input and compute its distribution. I mean, the way we would do that typically, we would not save up the entire input because I give you a terabyte of input. We would cut the input up into blocks. Now maybe you're doing that anyway. If you're already cutting the input up into blocks, for example, to do what BZIP does, like a BWT, that's one thing. But we'd rather not have to make that assumption. It would be nice to have a, a, a way of viewing probabilities that could evolve over time, as opposed to, in fact, maybe sort of a sliding window approach to probabilities, where the probability of the symbol I that I'm encoding at step i is determined based on the probabilities I've observed over the last, I don't know, 1,000 steps. So if the file changes, if the patterns in the file evolve over the course of the file, I catch up with that. Any model I use, no matter what the probabilities are at each step, any model I use where every symbol that could appear has a probability that's non-zero, and where the decompressor can keep up with the changes I make, that's a valid scheme. So how about this? We'll try a basic example where I use a dynamic probability distribution, where every time I read a new character, I modify my distribution to um, reflect the apparent um, frequency of that character. I will start, so both compressor and decompressor will start with no knowledge of the input sequence. They will start by assuming that every character has equal probability. As each character is read, we'll increment its probability to reflect that apparently we're seeing it more often. And over the course of the input, we will slowly approach the true distribution of the characters. And this means I don't actually have to, although my initial few symbols will be compressed rather inefficiently, I don't have to encode any frequency table because the model that I'm using will learn the frequencies over time as it decompresses. Um, so what I'll do is uh, I, I will um, use the following basic model, which is I will compute at a particular step. Um, so at a particular step in my algorithm, there are k possible symbols. At, at, when I'm reading um, a particular value of my input, I will assume that the probability of, of one symbol occurring equals this value, which basically amounts to um, a, a frequency of 1 plus the number of times I've actually seen that symbol so far. And this denominator is such to, is just enough to normalize that. So maybe it's obvious from the way that I've, I've phrased this, saying modeling, for example, this is a very simple statistical model. Um, and what we want is something a bit more powerful than this. We want a predictive model. We want something that can proactively try and figure out what the next character is going to be based on previous results and assign it a high probability. We know that if the symbol we're about to encode is encoded with a higher probability, I need fewer bits to encode it. We already learned the whole gimmick behind arithmetic coding is if a symbol has a larger window in the cumulative probability distribution, then it will be encoded in fewer bits. Maybe we can proactively set up a model that predicts what the next symbol is going to be or what the next three most likely symbols are and assigns them huge probabilities to minimize the number of bits that I need. So we'll start with our basic approach and the equation I gave is a bit opaque so I can show how I would implement this. Um, I start with my arithmetic coder set up as usual so low is 0, high is 1 and suppose that I know that my input uses this set of symbols. I know that's a bit of a stretch given that I'm not supposed to know anything. The way you would do this for 8-bit values is you would have a table with 256 possible values and before you've read any input you assume and the, de and the decompressor also assumes that every symbol has a frequency of 1 and then you compute your cumulative values based on those. Uh, so I start with a uniform distribution because before I've seen any input, I don't know what I'm going to see. As I encode each symbol, I, so I just saw an A, so I increment the frequency of A. 
because in my input, I've now seen an A and I haven't seen anything else, which indicates maybe A is more common in this input. Um, and then I encode the space. Um, oh, actually, well, I'll bring this up in a minute. Then I encode the space, so I increment its frequency, uh, and that widens the window for a space. So now every, every space I encode after this one will be encoded in slightly fewer bits, which is ev as evidence um, uh, to, to, to testify to the fact that space appears to be a more common character than, let's say, the semicolon in this input. Uh, and so I keep going, and as I go, my distribution evolves. But at each step, when I'm encoding the current character D, my, my idea of the current distribution of probabilities is whatever I had at the end of the previous step. And the decompressor would have the same thing. If the decompressor keeps up with me, which it does, it'll also have this table at the end of the previous step. So it'll know uh, if I encode a cumulative value of 0.35, it'll know that that means D at this step. And then it'll increment the probability for D after the step is over. Uh, and so I keep going. And of course, as I go, the distribution evolves to more closely approximate the true distribution of the input. And so we'll just, we'll just churn through this. And then I choose this representative. This is just a review of arithmetic coding. So I choose this representative. And as this, as this continues, um, even though I didn't share any information about the distribution of the decompressor to begin with, it will slowly um, become more and more efficient at processing this kind of input. Uh, and then here's how it would do that. So the decompressor does the same thing. I give it the representative that I chose. Suppose I chose this one. Uh, and the decompressor starts from a uniform distribution and then makes the same set of updates at each step that the compressor does. And so it is able to, um, whoops, it, it is able to produce, to, to reproduce the um, input string, even though I didn't share anything about the probabilities. It just built them up as it went along. And you should, there's a parallel you should see here between this and LZW which is LZW has to build up this symbol table, but it can always, without having to send the symbol table over to the decompressor in advance. And it can do that because it can devise a strategy where the decompressor can construct the symbol table just like the compressor does. Um, so the issue here is that if I actually were using the real distribution, so if I looked at my entire input in advance, computed its probability distribution, and then sent it over to you, then I could encode the input more efficiently than I did here. Because the first few symbols were encoded with a uniform distribution, which we know isn't very efficient. It's not going to give us very good compression. Um, and over time, I get closer and closer to the real one. But it doesn't take very long. I mean, this is, uh, what, 10 or 15 bytes or something. Um, and I'm already, there, there's already a significant stratification appearing in the cumulative frequencies of uh, individual values. This is getting almost 0.3. This is only getting about 0.1. Um, and so you can see why in a moderately sized input, th this would still be a very effective approach. Uh, so I can, it turns out that if arithmetic coding is um, run on a sequence that's uh, symbols are independent and identically distributed, so that assumption you've been making all along, and where it uses that true distribution, then the number of bits it ends up using will approach entropy over time. We saw that on short sequences, there's some overhead, there's some rounding errors, but over time, arithmetic coding can actually achieve entropy asymptotically. It gets closer and closer to achieving entropy if it uses the true distribution. Maybe we don't want to share the true distribution because that's a lot of overhead to add. But more importantly, maybe we would like to get even better than entropy. So the entropy we've been working with is this uh, first order entropy, which is assuming symbols are independent. But we know that there's lots of inputs where symbols aren't independent. And a basic example would be if you're compressing English text um, and you see a space and then you see the letter T. Well, OK, what's the next symbol going to be? Is it going to be the letter T again? Well, if it's English text, there aren't very many words that begin with two Ts. Is it going to be the letter H? That's pretty likely. If, uh, if you have the beginning of a word, so a space followed by a T, then it's, there's a lot of English words that begin TH. And so there are dependencies in our data. Maybe we resolved some of these using RLE, using delta compression, using a BWT, who knows? But uh, there may still be dependencies. Maybe we can do better than entropy if we can build that in. For example, after we see the letter T, we could say we could, between the compressor and decompressor, you could predefine, after you've seen the letter T, significantly amplify the probability that the next character is H, to give H a shorter encoding. So we could design a scheme that um, deliberately modifies probabilities because of observed dependencies. And English text is a great example of that. And another example would be, in English text, you see the letter Q. 
Is the probability of seeing the letter U after a Q equal to one? Well, well, no, because maybe there is some word out there that has a Q followed by something that isn't a U. But I'll bet the probability of, if you look at English text, on average, if you see a letter Q, the probability that the next character is U is extremely high much higher than the probability of a U being observed in text in general. So having the ability to modify this distribution gives us a lot more power than we already had with entropy coding, with the assumption that we're making that symbols are independent and identically dis distributed. Um, and so we can leverage that. As long as the decompressor can keep up, we can leverage that. So. Um, the basic adaptive model, and I, I'm going to keep referring to what we just had there as a, the basic adaptive model. I think it's the simplest example of an adaptive model that uses the input data. It doesn't really compete with the true distribution, but the advantage that it has is that there is zero overhead. Both the compressor and decompressor start with nothing. They send, there is no data conveyed from the compressor to decompressor before it starts sending the actual encoded bits. Um, and all of the information that it accumulates over time is learned by the in, uh, based on the decompressed data. That's it. The only things a decompressor knows at the end are what the decompressed data already told it. And so if you design adaptive models that do that, and just to be clear, they don't have to. You could design an adaptive model that also uses some metadata. So one example would be in your assignment three, you could program in three or four distinct adaptive models. One that's optimized for text, one that's optimized for, um, I don't know, image files or something. And then you could, as the first few bits of your encoded data, you could encode some metadata, like an eight bit value that says which adaptive model should I use or maybe some basic um, uh, initialization values for the adaptive model. You could do that. You could get the best of both worlds. But in general, uh, you're, there's no requirement you have any overhead in the adaptive model at all because you could rely on the decompressor or the model adapting based only on what it learns over time. Now, earlier in the course, there were a few mentions of things like machine learning and AI that I sort of deferred. I said we don't know enough about this subject to talk about the application of those. Um, the Handbook of Data Compression, the big book that we've been using, is, is a bit old. It covers all the schemes we've needed so far in great detail. It, it was written just as the term AI stopped being a dirty word, I guess, about in, in the late 2000s. And there's been a, such a huge number of developments in compression driven by AI and machine learning since then that an adaptive model based on those techniques could be incredibly powerful and many of you who have expertise in that area could implement such a thing for Assignment 3 with great results. Um, so here are some things adaptive models might do. So I, I'm not, I, because we need to have a little bit of a break here, um, I'm not going to go into, I could spend five lectures on this. Instead, I'm going to talk about some key points. And then I hope that all of you will consider implementing some kind of adaptive model, Huffman or arithmetic or whatever, on assignment three. Although you don't have to. Assignment three does provide a path where you could just via no um, known techniques. You could develop your own techniques for everything and achieve great compression. Um, but some things you might see in advanced adaptive models are um, looking at the previous bits of input and making some prediction for the next character. We've talked about predictive modeling already in our discussion of delta compression. So make predictions about the most likely next characters. And then um, uh, weight the probabilities of those characters based on the prediction. So if you determine, for example, you just saw the letter Q, and you determine that the letter U is very likely, you feed that into your arithmetic coder by assigning U an extremely high probability or something. Uh, and that would be one way of um, of biasing uh, the probability of the next character such that it gets a small encoding if your prediction is right. And the idea there is that means the better you are at predicting things, the uh, smaller the encoding gets and you can still be wrong. If the next character isn't the letter U, maybe it's the letter A, well, you assign that, that that was in your prediction not very likely to occur. It has a very low probability. But even if you're wrong, you can still encode the letter A. It just ends up being less efficient. And so you can begin playing the odds. You can guess and then, if, based on the success of your guess, get better encodings, but not break your compressor. You can still compress things even if your guess is wrong. We like that property, and we saw that with the basic linear prediction model we used a month and a half ago. Um, par part of that usually involves using the previously seen characters or sequences of characters as part of that prediction process. And then finally, adding extra symbols to our symbol set to allow maybe the compressor to send hints to the decompressor about things. Now we've seen already that early on we thought adding extra symbols was not a good idea. We said we have 8-bit symbols and if we add any more we have to have 9-bit symbols. But we know from assignment two and from talking about BZIP that actually adding symbols is cheap. 
because the way that we're encoding things isn't some fixed number of bits. It's, it's weighted based on the occurrence of each symbol. And so we saw, for example, in deflate, it adds all sorts of extra symbols. Even to the basic alphabet, it adds 30 extra symbols for these uh, length codes and for the end of block marker. That's no big deal. If you never use them, then give them low probabilities. Um, and so we can add extra symbols to our arithmetic coder for any time in the middle of encoding where the compressor has to send some information to the decompressor to tell it what to do. And I'm going to go over some basic examples of the application of that. Um, and just to be absolutely clear, uh, you can use adaptive models on Huffman coding too. The, the adaptive part of this is just modifying probabilities. It doesn't necessarily require arithmetic coding. Um, and there are efficient adaptive Huffman coding methods. They're just a little bit more involved than what you'd need to do for an arithmetic coder. Um, so let's try this. Uh, I could, for example, work out in advance what I think um, the probability of... Uh, a particular character given the previous one is, or I could make an adaptive model with multiple probability tables, each of which adapts. So here I'm using a uniform distribution, and I have three separate probability tables. And these, and which table I use at each step depends on what the previous character was. And I suppose for the sake of breaking the tie, on the very first step, when there is no previous character, we'll just assume it was an A, just for lack of anything better to do. And then at each step, I'll switch the table that I use to encode the next character is based on the previous character. And you can think, this will mean that if you tend to see cases like A, B over and over again in your, in your input sequence, then in the, in the table for previous character was A, B will end up with a very high probability. And so you get a sort of feedback loop. The more you see A, Bs, the cheaper it is to encode A, Bs. And so we start with uniform distribution, and then as we go along, we increment the counts under each, uh, in each table based on uh, our observed occurrences. The decompressor and the compressor are both keeping three tables. That's hard-coded in. They don't need to send each other any information to do that. And as they walk along, they increment probabilities. And they can leverage dependencies that exist in the data as they go. And of course, the longer the model runs, the more accurate it gets, assuming that, predict assuming that the input data's patterns are consistent throughout. Um, and so, oh, sorry, um, the tables in this case are, are pointing out stuff like this is saying that if the previous character was C, the probability that the next character is C is extremely high. And then, of course, think about this. This is less than uh, one bit uh, of information. A probability of 0.98 is an incredibly tiny number of bits of information. And we know that arithmetic coding over time can achieve the actual information content of each symbol. If the character C is 0.3 bits of information, arithmetic coding over time does actually achieve encoding a C into 0.3 bits of information. So this probability means that encoding two Cs in a row is almost like just encoding one character. Um, and it also says things like A is very rarely followed by an A. Because, well, in the table of when the previous character was an A, the next character was generally not an A. And so we can use this. Now, what you should be thinking is, why don't we do this for more than two characters? Not just was the previous character an A, but was the previous sequence of characters A, B, C or something? And we can do that. But then it becomes a matter of how many probability tables do we want to keep around? And I'll talk at the very end of this about a mechanism we could use to sort of uh, split the difference there. And then here's a case where I didn't proofread the slides properly. I will fix that before I post them. Um, I'll make a note about that. We're on number 64 here. Um, so uh, we, the trade-off we're making here is we can keep as many probability tables as we want uh, and doesn't add anything to our encoded bitstream. This is just compiled into the compressor and decompressor. These initial conditions are static. They always start at a uniform distribution. I can have as many layers of probability tables as I want up to my, the obvious limits of uh, space and time complexity. So I don't, and, and what's great about this is now suddenly I'm scaling compression very easily just based on computational power. It's really easy for me to make compression better by just adding more and more layers of prediction logic, and that's it. I don't have to make the compressed bitstream any different. And we'll notice that modern compression schemes that use horrendous amounts of memory or processing time, they're leveraging this. Really, all of the power is going into their prediction logic um, or into uh, symbol tables and things, things that are being maintained independently uh, of the actual encoded bitstream. Um, so th this earlier um, distribution that we use, the basic adaptive model, 
uh, begins by assuming that every symbol that could occur, and in this example there's only five of them, but obviously the way you should treat this is all 8-bit symbols. Every symbol that could occur occurs with equal frequency. And then we assume that over time, some of these frequencies overwhelm the others. They never go down, but eventually the impact of the, of the 1 in this column is outweighed by the incredible impact of that 1,000. But it still sort of has a drag on performance because if I never see, let's say, the okay, oh boy, I need to pr another proofreading error. What if the symbol C never appears? Well, that wouldn't be the least bit surprising because it's not in the table to begin with. Um, what if the symbol, no, not, not S, can I use, okay, D. <laughs> what if the symbol D never appears? Well, notice that D will always have a bit of real estate. It'll always eat up just a bit of our probability window. It's true that over time, its cumulative probability will go lower and lower and lower as the frequency of other things goes up. But we've always given it a frequency of 1 because we don't want to rule out that D will, will um, appear at some point. And we know that if it has a probability of 0, we can't encode it. It needs to have a non-empty probability window. And think about it not in terms of this five-character thing, but what if you had a table of 256 symbols and each one gets a frequency of 1? So at the and only two symbols ever actually appear. Well, if that's the case, quite a bit of real estate's being eaten up by symbols that we're just holding a seat for. We're just reserving space for them for later. So what I want to talk about now is um, that third bullet point from earlier of what if we design a scheme where the uh, maybe we make compromise, like we say, look, let's assume everything appears zero times. Now, of course, if that's the case, how do I encode the letter A? I mean, it occurs zero times. Its probability is is zero. Well, what we could do is we could add extra symbols where if I ever send one of these extra symbols, the decompressor changes modes and does something different. So I'm going to illustrate a brief example of a model that does that. Um, I'm going to keep two probability tables. The adaptive table, which is the one I would prefer to use, which gets initialized to all zeros and a sort of backup table that's always a uniform distribution. So notice that if I'm trying to encode a letter and um, its encoding, its frequency here is zero, then I can't encode it using this distribution. Of course, I can encode anything I want using this distribution because it has a non-zero probability, but the probability is uniform, so the encoding isn't very efficient. But why don't I have the option of just switching back and forth? I mean, ideally, I know that the adaptive distribution over time has some advantages. So maybe we will, by default, always try and encode our symbol with this distribution. But if we can't, I will signal, uh, signal to the decompressor, whoops, couldn't do it, and I'll tell the decompressor, okay, for this step, we're going to use the other table. Now, how am I going to do that, though? Like, how do I tell the decompressor in the middle of a compression algorithm to suddenly change modes? And the thing I'm going to do, to, basically, I need some way of sending it a symbol. Um, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to add a brand new symbol to my set of symbols. I'm going to call it an escape symbol. And we know that this is possible because we've been adding extra symbols all along. We've, I mean, for example, even in arithmetic coding, we keep adding this end of block marker or end of stream symbol to indicate that encoding should stop. But outside of that, we've been using these characters run A and run B and bzip. We have all that huge extra set of length symbols in deflate. So we know that we can add whatever extra symbols we want. So what I do is I tell the uh, we write the, com the compressor and decompressor under the assumption that at all times, at the beginning of every step, they are going to use this distribution. And I encode at every step a symbol. If I want the decompressor to switch distributions, then the symbol I encode will be the special escape symbol. And that tells the decompressor, if it sees that symbol, that tells it, for the next step only, use the other distribution, and then switch back. Now, because I have to send it the escape character in my encoded sequence, the escape character is a legitimate symbol, which means I have to be able to encode it just like anything else. Um, and so I have to actually have it be in my distribution. And that does mean that, yes, I do have to have it eat up some of my probability space. But no notice how I'm eating up way less of my probability space here uh, than if I gave everything a frequency of 1. Notice also, interesting statistical quirk here, because the initial probability of the escape symbol is 1, the very first character will always be the escape symbol, which we'll see makes sense if we, if, once we've looked at the example. Okay, so if I want to encode the character A, uh, at this step I try to encode the character A, and I observe that there is the frequency for A is 0, so I can't. Uh, 
So I have to tell the decompressor, I need you to use the other table for just one step. So I send the decomp I encode this symbol, which does have an encoding, and then I say, okay, now that you're using the other table, I'm gonna encode the character A using the other table. So it's not a very efficient encoding, but I now have a way of telling you to use that table. And then once I've encoded that, I increment the, the frequency in the, in the real distribution just like I would otherwise. So if I want to encode another letter A, I can just do it directly. I don't have to send the escape symbol for the second character A. But I now want to encode a space. So to encode a space, uh, I have to send the escape symbol and then tell the, decom and tell the decompressor to use the other table. And then I have to um, uh, encode the space. Um, you, you might notice that in the uniform distribution, the escape symbol has a frequency of zero. And that's because I never need to do a mode switch out of the uniform distribution. Uh, I tell the decompressor to use the uniform distribution when it tries to, when it's supposed to use this distribution, I tell it with the escape symbol, switch distributions for one step only. And if I do that, there's never any need for me to tell it to switch back because it switches back automatically. And so I'll never need this. If I, for some reason, did want to switch freely between the two tables, which does happen in some adaptive models, then I would need to make sure that at every step, the escape symbol always has a non-zero frequency. So there's always a way of encoding it. No matter how small that probability is, it needs to be non-zero. Okay, so we'll keep encoding here. We'll wait until we get to something we've seen before. So I encode S, and the next character is the letter A. So to encode A, we start by taking a look here. And we can see, yeah, the A has actually got a non-zero probability in this distribution. So we just encode it, and we're good. There's no need for an escape symbol. Uh, and you might notice as we go on further and further into this process, I'm going to need escape symbols less and less, because once I've seen a symbol for the first time, I'll never need to escape it again. And so we'll just we'll complete the example. And we can see that the, the total, it's actually interesting to note here, I've got one, two, three, four, five escape symbols, and I've now seen every character at least once. I will never need an escape symbol again with this very basic model. Now the reason that I brought it up is that think about how you could create a model with like 10 different escape symbols and you could use them to switch between as many different distribution tables as you want whenever you wanted. It's still sort of nice to not need one. So back in this previous example where the switch happened automatically, there's never a need to tell the decompressor which table to use because it just uses the table that goes with the previous character. That's also nice. We're not wasting bandwidth encoding escape symbols. But an escape symbol does provide us a good mechanism to um, sort of uh, bail out if our model is somehow catastrophically wrong. We want our model to be right. So we, we want, for example, if the next character is S, it gets encoded with this probability. Maybe the actual probability of S is much higher, but the model still gives us an easy way to encode an S. On the other hand, at this step, if the next character is L, which it is, then the model just doesn't work. I want to be able to write models that occasionally completely fail and then build in an escape clause to let them pick it back up again because that ability does uh, allow me a greater set of options in terms of how I define my model. Okay, so we'll get to the end of this. Um, one thing I could uh, observe here is that every time I use a real symbol, like when I use the letter A, I increment its frequency. I wrote a whole bunch of escape symbols and I never incremented its frequency. Uh, could I do that? Absolutely. We could argue that if I keep seeing escape symbols, maybe I should increment their frequency so that they're easier to encode. In this case, I would say it's actually better that I don't. I like the idea that as time goes by, if the frequency of the escape symbol stays the same, its probability slowly goes down because at first it's got a really high probability and then if the frequency stays the same, the probability goes down as the steps go by. I think that makes sense because as I said earlier, you only need an escape symbol once for each character. And that means as time goes by, the likelihood that you're going to need another escape symbol goes down. And so it actually makes sense in this case for the probability of the escape symbol to go down over time, not up. Uh, and th it turns out the model we're going to see next, the sort of we're going to skim over a different model, that there are lots of schools of thought on this. In this example, I think it's justified for the probability of the escape symbol to, to go down over time. And I actually would say another thing we can do is when both compressor and decompressor notice a non-zero count in all of the other symbols, then they should set this to zero because it'll never appear again. And, it, and setting it to zero is great because it does save us 0.08 probability. And so we can redistribute that and, and get a little bit more mileage out of the rest of our symbols. Any tiny amount counts. It helps compression just a little bit. So I want to talk about one more thing. I want to get into some detail about one example of a more advanced model. Before I do that, I want to get to this. So I, I um, a minute ago, I, I basically um, brushed past this, but I, I want to address this, which is maybe you noticed 
uh, as, I, as I mentioned, that we had this weird situation at the very beginning where um, I was encoding a symbol with apparently the probability one, right? So the very first symbol I encode, every time uh, we begin a step, both compressor and decompressor assume that they are in the adaptive distribution. And we know that because there's nothing useful in there at the first step, I mean, every symbol I could possibly want to encode is not there, its frequency is zero, I have to, I, I'm required, I have no choice, I have to emit an escape symbol as my first symbol. That itself is no big deal. Both compressor and decompressor know that. What's weird is that I can only emit an escape symbol. I have to send something from the adaptive distribution, so I send an escape symbol, but its probability is one, it's one over one. It's, it's just one. Uh, so what do I do? How does that work? How do I encode a symbol with probability one? So the first thing is, this is a weird, we, we, it's a sort of weird conceptual snarl. So you could look at this and say, wait a minute, if both compressor and decompressor know that the next symbol is an escape symbol, why do I have to send anything at all? Why not just have them both skip over the next symbol? And why bother encoding a symbol with probability one? Now, what if I told you that you could have it both ways? You could avoid sending the symbol and send the symbol with probability one. So if you send the symbol with probability one, what happens with the arithmetic coder? Now, we don't have to use arithmetic coding for this, but suppose we are. Um, if we do that, the probability is one. So the low and high values in the coder don't change at all. And that, of course, means that the, the status of my representative hasn't changed either. And so if I send a symbol with probability one, I am encoding it in zero bits because my low and high values don't change at all. Okay, how does that make any sense? Well, keep in mind, the decompressor also knows the probability of the next symbol, uh, of the escape symbol is one here, which means even before I've sent it, the decompressor knows that the next symbol is the escape symbol, and the compressor knows the next symbol is the escape symbol, and so it, it vacuously encodes a symbol in zero bits, and then, I'm doing air quotes, you can't see them, it sends that symbol across. So this is actually just a weird notational device. I'm not adding any extra bits to my sequence, but really this is being sent because both compressor and decompressor agree that it's there. So just to, rem just to keep that in mind, sending symbols with probability one costs nothing. The symbol is being sent, but it's being sent because both parties agree that it's there. There's no need for them to actually say that it's there. So that's a, that's a weird conceptual thing. Um, and so just to observe that, we could, of course, have both things just skip over that because they know the next symbol is a, an escape symbol, but we could also represent that as notionally sending a symbol in zero bits. Really, it's just a, a case of how we describe that operation. Okay, so the reason I bring that up is because in the last example, that was just a curiosity, but we want to use that in the next example to keep things straight. It'll turn out to, to make things a lot easier, and it's a bit of a, 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 a difficult example. It's, quite, it's a bit of a nasty example we're going to see just coming up. So we need all the help we can get. So what I want to talk about is something called prediction by partial matching. And it's a modeling scheme. So it, it's for determining the, the probability of the next symbol. And the idea is that I should be able to use not just the previous symbol, as I did a minute ago, but all of the previous symbols, I guess, to help me model the probability of the next symbol. Um, and so suppose I'm transmitting the word salad and I've already transmitted these three characters and I'm about to transmit the letter A. The decompressor and I, the compressor, both know these are the three characters that came before. And I want to now send the letter A. And I want to, the probability that I use for the letter A to be as high as possible, subject to the decompressor also being able to replicate that decision. So suppose the decompressor and I both know that everywhere else in the string that I saw the letters S-A-L, well, two-thirds of the time, I saw the letter A right afterwards. And one-third of the time, I saw the letter S. So two-thirds of the time, I guess I was using the word salad. One-third of the time, I was using the word salsa, for example. So the decompressor and I both know that after the last occurrences of S-A-L, A occurred two-thirds of the time, and S occurred one-third of the time. Prediction by partial matching predicts the probability of A to therefore be two-thirds. And then, when I encode A, because A is one of my options, I notice A was present two-thirds of the time I saw SAL in the past, I encode A using a probability of two-thirds. Now think for a moment, two-thirds is a huge number. 
In, in, the, in the world of probabilities, given what we've been working with so far, two-thirds is massive, keeping also in mind that in a body of English text, you're not going to see, I would expect, any letter more than half of the time. And if I'm working with English words like salad and salsa and things, I don't expect A is actually going to have a true global probability of 0.66. But here, you, modeling using the context that I have, I could say, given that my previous three characters were SAL, I would like to predict that A has a probability of two-thirds. The decompressor can mirror that, it also sees this, and it could assume I'm making that prediction, and I'm going to encode it with that probability. That's incredible. Um, now there are some issues maybe that are already obvious here, which is, sure, the last two times, or the last few times you saw SAL, you saw an A or an S afterwards. But what if I want to encode SALE? And the last, time, last few times you saw SAL, you saw A or S. What probability do I use for E? Well, I don't know. It looks like all the probabilities are taken. If A is two thirds and S is one third, what do I do? How do I tell the decompressor that it's seeing a character that it's about to see a character that doesn't normally exist in this context? So what I'll do is I will keep track of the context being the last few characters. And by default, both compressor and decompressor start, whoops, they start by assuming that the context is as large as possible. But if for some reason the context that I'm using isn't sufficient on the compressor side, so for example, if there is no letter E in the current context, what I will do is I will send an escape symbol to the decompressor to tell it, delete one character from the context. Maybe other times that I've seen AL, I've seen an E afterwards. If I haven't, I, I send the decompressor another escape symbol to delete one more character from the context. And I keep doing that if I need to until I get to an empty context. And eventually I will have, if I've, and if I've never seen an E at all, I might have to go down even further like I did in the previous example and go to a uniform distribution. But I can use escape symbols to modulate this decision process where both the decompressor and the compressor use the context um, to try and uh, predict a higher probability. So when I use the term context in this example, I'm referring to a string of characters up to, but not including, the current character. So back to our salad example. My context could be this, it could be this, or it could just be the L. There are models that allow you to use as context characters that don't include the most recent character. So you could use just SA and then a blank, uh, but PPM in this example doesn't. PPM is a massive family of models, and I'm sure there are some in that family that actually do that. Um, it's sort of the, the modeling version of the LZ family for a lot of reasons, not only because it relies on previously seen sequences, but because the family has a broad family tree that, that um, where the difference between family members is determined sort of by the choices made about when to emit escape characters, how many to emit, what frequencies to use for them and so on. And so just like our previous model, when I'm encoding the next symbol, I uh, am using all of the context um, values that I have accumulated over the course of the input. Um, so if I have my input that I'm going to use in a minute or something like a sad salad, um, if I get to this point here, the decompressor and I both have all of the context before me, and I'm allowed to use any string of context, starting with the longest one and working my way down, and all previous occurrences of that context um, to help model the probability. And I want to—I'll describe that in greater detail uh, coming up. So suppose that we're encoding a more um, synthetic example. I'm encoding A, B, C, and then B, and the B is the thing that the decompressor has not yet seen. So here, uh, I'll pick some maximum context length, because you can see that if the input is gigabytes long, I can't assume that I've got every possible gigabytes long substring stored somewhere. So suppose I choose the length three, but keep in mind what I'm encoding is somewhere down at the end of a long sequence. So I could have seen ABC lots of other times in the past. Um, and I start by assuming my context is all three of the previous characters. But if I've never seen B in the context of ABC before, then, I tell the decompressor, knock it down, and let's see whether I've ever seen B in the context of just BC before. Uh, and I keep knocking away uh, uh, characters from the beginning of my context until I get down to zero characters. So for example, I could have these context tables. And in PPM, both compressor and decompressor, off to the side, in memory, will store tables of the frequency of each character in various contexts. So for the context, the three previous characters A, B, C, the, the number of times I've seen A, B, C followed by A is three, the number of times I've seen it followed by B is five, and followed by C is six. Now over here, if I've just seen the two characters B, C, and then who knows what came before, then the number of times I've seen an A is five, B, 10, C, eight, D, 10, and E, 15. 
Now you'll notice that if I've seen the letter C after ABC, then I've also seen the letter C just after BC. So, so this, this is actually a subset of this table. But there are some characters that I've seen after a B and a C that I've never seen after ABC. Uh, and so if I ever encounter an E after ABC, I will add it over here, but at the moment I have not seen that. Um, and so suppose I have these distributions and I want to encode, uh, as I saw, as we saw in the previous slide, my next character was actually the character B. So in the context ABC, I do have a letter B that I've already seen in that context. And the total of these three numbers um, is 14. And so I encode the letter B with um, the probability 5 over 14. Uh, and, that's, and if you think about it, given that my alphabet could be all 8-bit symbols where probabilities aren't very high, 5 over 14, which is over one-third, is a pretty big number. It's a, in, in, the, in the world of probabilities over large symbol sets, that's pretty good. Um, now, after I encode the B and I send it across, both compressor and decompressor, so once the decompressor has decompressed the symbol, it updates all of the frequency numbers for B in all contexts that apply. So if I send across the encoding of B after ABC, then I have to go and update the frequency of B in the ABC context. I have to go update the frequency of B in the BC context. And I have to go update the frequency of B in the C context. And I even have to go update the frequency of B in the empty string context. And so as I mentioned a couple slides ago, um, the context can be empty or it can be any number of previous characters up to some limit. And just to remind, um, I typically use this notation, the character epsilon, for the empty string, just like you might have done in 320 just because if I write, this gets a little bit abrasive over time. What about this? Uh, so I'm encoding and I've seen ABC, so I'm in the context ABC, but I want to encode a D. The problem is the decompressor assumes that the, the, the probability I send it corresponds to this context table, but there is no D in this context table. I can't encode a character with a probability of zero, so what do I do? Well, one option would be to initialize every context table with a uniform distribution and then increment it over time. But we've seen that can be a bit wasteful. The whole point of this gimmick is that I want to make sure that I only have in the ABC context table things that have ever really appeared in the context ABC. So what I'll do instead is similar to our previous uh, adaptive model with the two distributions, which is if the current context can't give me what I want, I will add an escape symbol that allows me to bail out and tell the decompressor, for example, to delete one character from context and then go look in this context table instead. And we'll notice that there is a D in this context table. So to do that, I need to have the ability in the context I started in, because the decompressor always assumes I'm starting here, I have to tell it that I'm a, I need to bail out of the context. And that means I have to send it something. And the only things I can send it in this context right now are A, B, and C. So I need to add an extra symbol that's always available with some low probability that I can send if I want to bail out. And I could actually add multiple different escape symbols, but I'm going to only just only use one because that's all that's needed in the basic PPM. So I'll add an escape symbol. So every context table now gets an escape symbol with frequency one. And you'll notice over time, as the number of frequency as the frequency of each symbol increases, that escape symbol's overall probability will go lower and lower. So now what I do is I will uh, if I can't find the symbol I'm looking for. So if I'm trying to encode A, B, C and then I'm following it with a D. If I can't find that in the context that I'm, I start in, then I send an escape symbol, and that tells a decompressor, delete one character from the context, go look at the context table for the result. And then I can encode um, D. In this case, D does exist in this context. I will encode that with the probability, I think it's 10 over 50, yeah. Um, so I have to actually encode two symbols before I get the D. First, an escape symbol. Um, and the escape symbol's probability here would be what? So I guess I, I encode the escape symbol with um, the probability, I think it's 1 over 16. And then I encode D over here, once both I and the decompressor know to look at this table instead, with the probability of one, uh, 10 over 50, which equals 1 over 5, which is 0.2. Uh, and so th the aggregate probability of what I've emitted is actually 1 over 16 times 1 over 5, which isn't very impressive. Um, and that's because uh, the, maybe you can see this, but the point of PPM is over time to not need to bail out of context once the contexts fill up, once we've seen the context repeatedly.
Uh, and then once I've, once I've encoded the D and I've sent it across, after it's been decoded, the decompressor and I update all of the context tables that apply. And so now D is in the context ABC. Uh, and so if I ever see ABC followed by D again, I don't need to do, I don't need to bail out of the context. So here's this. This is a diagram that has consumed, uh, if you're watching this lecture and the, and the lecture got delayed by two days, it is because of this diagram causing me all sorts of grief. I have probably consumed uh, 15 hours of my time and uh, several hours of computing time compiling these slides over and over again because of all the ways these, these, this diagram has caused me trouble. So we've, we can't cover too many more of these models basically because there's a limit to how much information I can put on a slide such that it's even remotely readable. So what I'm going to go through here is the probabilities that are used by PPM when encoding this, this piece of data. I can't show you the result of the arithmetic coder, but keep in mind that we can feed in whatever probabilities we want to an arithmetic coder, as long as both the compressor and decompressor know what probabilities I'm using at, at each step. So here's what's going to happen. At each step, I'm going to have my initial context, which at this point is empty because I've encoded nothing yet, but normally it'll be the last three characters. So this is a model where I've limited the maximum context length to three. Um, and that's a member of the PPM3 family. And the reason I'm using three and not something else is, well, first, the more context lengths you have, the more likely you end up eating up lots of memory, uh, but also because the slide's only so wide. So I'm using three. Um, and so at each step, I've got a context, and, and as time goes by, usually, like when I encode this, my context will be the three previous characters. And I go looking in my context table under link three for the context A space S. And if I can't find it, then I guess I have to bail out um, and go back to context length two. And I'll keep bailing out until I find the previous context, or even, for example, right now, there's nothing in context length zero. So normally in context length zero, you'd have empty string followed by, let's say, A. And that happened once. And you have empty string followed by B. That happened three times, something like that. But before I've ever seen an A and B, there's no entry even in length zero. And so if I get down to length zero and I still don't have the, con and the context and the symbol I'm looking at still don't exist there, I can bail out one more level. And so we have this, we'll call it length negative one. And below length zero is a uniform distribution. So length negative one is initialized to a uniform distribution. So you can always bail out all the way down to level negative one if the next symbol you're encoding has never been seen in any context before. And of course we want to avoid that because that requires encoding a lot of escape symbols. Um, and that this, these slides are slowly explaining that. Um, but generally speaking, at each step, both encoder and decoder begin by assuming that the, the longest possible context you have has the next symbol. If the compressor discovers that's not the case, the compressor has to emit escape symbols uh, enough times to tell the decompressor which level to go down to. Um, okay, so step one. At step one, I'm encoding the symbol A, and the context is empty. So I go looking in context length zero. I say, have we ever seen an empty string and an A? And the answer is no. So I have to bail out. I go down to level negative one. Uh, and I encode A with probability one over seven. Now just to be clear, I'm actually sending two symbols here. I'm sending escape symbol followed by A. Uh, and we'll see in a minute that it turns out the escape symbol has probability one in this context because currently there's nothing else there so obviously I couldn't be picking any other symbol. So the total probability which is what I'm going to be writing up at the top right here will be computed by multiplying together the probabilities of all the escape symbols and the symbol I eventually emit. So I'll get back to that in a minute. So I encode A, I send it over. Once the decompressor uh, decodes it, uh, both me and the decompressor update our context. And so here I've written, okay, in context empty string, there's A and it occurred once. Okay, but wait, what's that one over two business? Well, in every context, we actually have to have a, a, a uh, escape symbol. I need to be able to bail out of that context, as I mentioned a minute ago. So on this diagram, to save space, which I really need to do, to save space, I'm going to assume that every time you see a context depicted, and over time we'll see many different contexts at each level, every time you see a context depicted, there is always an, empty, uh, an escape symbol at the bottom of that context table, and it always has a frequency of 1. So the way I've drawn this is the frequency is one and the cumulative, the, the, the total frequency of the whole context is two because there actually are two symbols in the context, uh, the escape symbol and the letter A. So that's where that one half is coming from. Um, and, and so yeah, we have to have, have an implicit escape symbol in the diagram here. Okay, so at the next, uh, at the next symbol is a space. 
And so uh, I am in the context A, and I go looking in my context A, and there are only two symbols in there, A and again, that implicit escape symbol. There is no, uh, or sorry, okay. I'm actually a step ahead of myself here. Um, I go looking in my context A, that's of length one. I go saying, is there a entry in the table for context length one with the context A followed by a space? And the answer is no, so I have to escape out. Okay, so I escape out. Now that escape happened with probability one because there's nothing in context length one. Okay, so I go down to context length zero and I say, is there, uh, and if I delete a character from this context, what do I get? Uh, I delete the A. Now my context is just an empty string. So I say, is there an empty string followed by a space? Answer is still no. So I escape out of this one. Now in the empty string context, the uh, escape symbol had probability one half because obviously there is something else in that context. Um, there's, I've, I've got empty string followed by A with frequency one, so probability one half. Uh, so in this case, this probability was one over one. And this probability was one over two. And then I get down here where of course I do see empty string followed by space with frequency, uh, with probability one over seven, frequency one, cumulative frequency, uh, total frequency seven. And so my overall probability is 1 14th. And just to, this slide tries to demonstrate that. I start in context A and I bail out. Because there's nothing in context A at all, uh, that's the, both the compressor and decompressor knew I was going to bail out. Uh, and so that happened with probability one. In context empty string, there is a symbol. It's the symbol A. So there, uh, and there's also the, the escape symbol. And so there are two possibilities. And so the, the probability that I bail out is only one half. And so when I emit the escape symbol, I have to encode probability one half. Then I go down to level negative one and I encode the space. Um, and, and so yeah, observe here again that the probability is, is one over one, which means that really nothing actually gets added to my encoded bitstream for this symbol. But it's nice to assume that I'm encoding it because it makes the sort of, in my mind, the conceptual understanding of what PPM does a bit easier to digest. And it's already a bit hard to digest. Um, Oh, and it's also worth considering that, yes, in this case, I'm actually encoding three symbols, probability one, probability one half, probability one seventh. Encoding three symbols with these three probabilities is equivalent in the eyes of arithmetic coding to encoding one symbol whose probability is the entire um, aggregate probability. So I actually can think about like how many bits did I need to encode this? Well, let's see, one over 14 is between one over eight and, um, oh, I better be careful about this. Uh, it's between one over eight and one over 16. So I needed somewhere between three and four bits to encode it. Okay, so now I'm, in the, uh, I'm back to the, the end of this step. Um, and so I, I was originally in the context A and I, once I've sent the, the symbol space, both compressor and decompressor go and update its count in every context where it was found. So first it creates an entry, context A, symbol space happens once. And remember, just like before, there is that implicit escape symbol there. And then down here in context empty string, there is a, a, a space following an empty string. And so we add, we put this as one, A as one, and then empty, empty escape symbol as one means that now it's one over three everywhere. And of course, we just leave the uniform distribution as it is. Um, and of course, for the first few steps, we're going to be seeing the first occurrence of a lot of symbols. And so here, my context starts at A space. And so I'm up in context length two, so I bail out, go down here. I'm looking for space followed by S. Okay, not there, bail out. Now I'm looking for empty string followed by S, not there, bail out. And then I encode it with probability one over seven. So I have to do a lot of bailing out at first to pull in the initial occurrence of each character. Uh, and so uh, here I start in context A space S. Uh, and so I get here, I go looking for, do I see A space S followed by A? Nope. Do I see space S followed by A? Nope. Do I see S followed by A here? Nope. Um, do I see empty string followed by A? Yes, actually there it is. So I encode A here. Um, and so it turns out that, okay, this was, um, this escape symbol was vacuous. Uh, and then in this, the escape symbol was actually also probability one because the context I was looking for at this step was space S and both decompressor and compressor know that there is no context space S. So I couldn't find a context space S. So probability one, I, I emit an escape symbol. Um, at this step, the probability so, uh, was, um, 
also one because I'm looking for the, sorry, I'm switching between my, my eraser and my pen here. Um, I'm looking for the symbol S, also not found. So probability one, I have to escape. And then I finally encode an A. And so actually all three of these end up having probability one. So they don't actually contribute at all to my ultimate probability. I just encode A with, uh, with uh, one quarter. Then I go and I update it and I add all those contexts that I was missing. And then we'll skip through this until something interesting happens. Um, and we can see, of course, we're going to have a bit of a memory issue here if we're not careful where we keep adding all these context entries. Um, and as long as compressor and decompressor is synchronized, that's fine. But that can be a bit of an issue in some cases. Usually if you define a well, if you have some well-defined logic like compressor and decompressor, keep track of how long it's been since they've used a certain context and then throw away contexts that are too old. As long as they both follow the same logic, you could use that to save some memory. Um, at this step, the initial context is space DA. Um, and so there's no space DA here, so I escape with probability one. There's no DA here, so I escape with probability one. Um, but there is an A here followed, oh, sorry, that's not an A, okay. An A here followed by a D. So I'm, I'm actually able to encode the D here in, in context A. So I escape twice, then encode D with probability one third. And notice that D does not actually occur with probability one third in my entire input, and certainly not in my uniform distribution. So I'm already saving, um, I'm already saving some, some bits here by using a higher probability. And then we'll keep going. We can see here the first occurrence of semicolon has a very high, a, a very low probability, unfortunately. Um, but I want to skip to when some interesting stuff happens, and maybe you can see as the contexts all fill up, we're going to begin being able to use long, longer contexts more often. And we can see in the longer context, there tend to be very few symbols and therefore very high probabilities. Um, okay, so the initial context at this step is A space A. So there's no A space A over here, escape with probability one. Now go looking for A space. Oh good, we have that. A space followed by S, probability one half. So we can now encode S with probability one half. Keeping in mind that S's actual probability here uh, in the entire string so far is one over 14. So I'm encoding it with a massive probability compared to its actual probability at this point. In my basic adaptive model, I would be encoding it with one over 14 probability. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, it take, if we take a look here, we're now back in A space S. We've seen A space S before, followed by an A. Uh, and we see again, A space S followed by an A. So we go looking. Do we have A space S followed by A? Yes, probability one half. So we encode A with probability one half, 0 0.5. That's encoding it in one bit, as opposed to if we used our global distribution where it would be encoded four over 15. Um, the slide agrees. Um, and so, yeah, the slides are pointing out what I pointed out a minute ago. We'll skip through until something interesting happens again. Um, so here, I'm looking at D space S. Uh, D space S doesn't exist here, so I escape with probability one. Space S exists here, and I've actually seen space S followed by A twice in the past, so I think that would be here and here. So A actually has probability from this context of two-thirds. Think about that. Normally, to get probabilities of greater than one half, you have to have one character dominate the sequence, which is not happening here. A, is account a accounts for less than half of the elements of the sequence, and we are able to encode it with a massive two-thirds probability. So it's less than one bit that we're using to store it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, here, and notice that I'm actually encoding an escape symbol with the A and still getting two thirds because the escape symbol has probability one because the context I'm looking for at that step wasn't there. Um, and then I update this. So I, after, so this is before the update, this is after. When I update it, A now has a probability of three quarters here. So if I see that combination again, which I, I won't um, in this string, I think, I'll actually be able to encode it with a probability of 0.75. Now, on the other hand, way late into the string, I see my very first L. And in this case, I have to encode it with um, 1 over 7,500, which I think we need about something like 13 bits for that, unfortunately. Um, and so we, we have to assume the first uh, occurrence of any character is going to cost us. Um, and so yeah, here we're managing to encode an A with uh, three quarters by doing it at this step. I escape out twice with um, ALS isn't found here, so I escape. LS isn't found here, so I escape with probability one. And so I'm able to encode an A with probability 0.75, uh, which is almost three times its global probability at this stage. Um, and so then we encode it, we add that. If I ever see that again, I'm going to encode it with 0.8 probability. 
Uh, and so maybe that gives you some hint. Now, the, really, PPM is way more complicated than this. There's so many variables like ways you could start in a different context, uh, synchronize the compressor and decompressor to start in a different context, to save the number of escape symbols, to increment or decrement escape symbol probabilities as you go, to increase, to decrease the drag uh, on the encoding. So for example, here, where I had to encode something with four escape symbols, I ended up with a very large probability. There are tweaks you can make to PPM, not unlike all the members of the LZ family. There are different family members that could do that. And there are also uh, important decisions to make about implementation. Um, things like if I want to actually keep all these contexts, how do I do that efficiently? Is there a way I could keep longer contexts without keeping as many contexts at each level? Um, and also are, there are cases where keeping the most, uh, keeping something from the, the larger context actually results in a lower probability than escaping out of it and encoding something from a lower context. Um, where you could tweak the algorithm to do that, similar to the sort of the, um, the lazy back reference encoding that deflate uses, the same logic there. Is it better to um, do things to move as quickly as possible to our result or maybe to skip over something? Uh, so th that's all we need to talk about for PPM, and hopefully if you wanted to do an adaptive model on assignment three, you now have an idea of what kind of modeling is done. And keep in mind, all of that is done outside of the encoded bit stream. It's just a matter of more processing time and more memory being used um, by the compressor and decompressor. And as long as they can stay in sync, uh, you can do whatever you want up to the limits of memory without affecting the encoded bit stream, besides, I guess, throwing in a couple of escape symbols.